Boom skis. Okay, we got the uh, we got Wesley Cabbage Correa coming in for um actually one of my first podcasts that I'm gonna professionally put together. I did a, a test run with uh, Kushi from Top Notch the other day. Um, but it's really, really raw and I, I'll do it over again. But so we have, we have the cabbage. What's up guys? Okay. Um, so everybody probably knows you. Well, most people know you from the UFC. So, um, I guess let's just talk about the UFC. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's, let's. Okay. So you are one of the pioneers for the, you know, the UFC, you along with BJ and who else is part of that, the first Hawaii wave, you know, um, that hit the UFC? Yes. Um, so the first Hawaii wave that actually hit the UFC was actually um, Kimo and that one guy Leopoldo, that, you're right. that play, he acted on Hawaii Five-0. That big guy, he he was the, he got starched though. But oh, he, he was, dude, yeah. the one that lost his tooth. Yeah. From La Ie. Yeah, he had the shrimp truck in, in Hawaii Five-0. And <laughs> him and Kimo was like the first guys that fought from there. And then after that, me and BJ picked up the reins. And we tried, we was just trying hard to get exposure on, on the Hawaii circuit, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, yes. I always felt like um, Hawaii boys was, a, it's an easy thing for Hawaii boys to be, become part of the UFC because, you know, um, that's, <laughs> it's kind of a thing, man. That's just how you settle shit. You just <laughs> scrap. Just knuckle up. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, shit's changed a lot though. But so from your guys, you, you know, you're running the UFC, what did you notice? What's the biggest changes from Hawaii's fighters back then to Hawaii's fighters now? Hawaii's fighters now, um, it's just, they're more evolved now. A lot of people are doing a lot of cross training. You know, you don't have really one dimensional fighters anymore coming from Hawaii, but just there need to be a lot more um, exposure for these Hawaii fighters because like, a lot of these small shows will just keep them locked down, you know? So yeah, they won't yeah. have time to grow and expand and be that bigger fighter that you want to be. They keep them locked down so that way they can make their money over here, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the money part, I remember, um, uh, you know, I guess a lot of people that follow me on Instagram know that we hang out a lot, you yeah. know? So, you know, um, Cabbage is always, um, you know, I have these discussions with him before this podcast was even an uh, idea. But um, you brought up a really good point about fighter representation um, for like you said, how uh, a union, if they had four, if you, if the fires get together and there's some kind of union or agents, much in the way that, um, you know, football or, or bo even boxing promoters, they have managers that, you know, um, do really well for them. What do you elaborate on that? Tell us about uh, that fighter union idea yeah. that you had. Yeah, the fighter union, I think that would be the best way for fighters to actually carry on to actually keep themselves active. Cause you figure a fighter's union, they keep them with medical and everything. So after you finish yeah. fighting, you still have medical coverage and then you can't mm -hmm. have fight, um, promoters undercutting you, you know, because you have a set stuff, you know, if you don't want to read it, all our fighters will sit down, you know, you're not going to have an event. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. And what a lot of fighters really stress out about is as soon as the UFC is done with you, they don't care about your medical records. You know what I mean? Look at Tim Sylvia, Tim Sylvia had to start a GoFundMe account to, to have the screws that, were coming out from his fight with Frank Mir removed, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that, it, and that's crazy because, you know, there's so, the UFC is, is, you know, the top rated MMA promotion too. So, I mean, to have that much money and not, um, kind of give back to the fighters, uh, a little bit, a little bit pilau, kind of raba, but, um, how, so instead of like, you know, um, the, the, my thing is kind of always, you know, instead of complaining, you know, how, how could we solve that? You know, what's a, what's a good way we could solve that? You know, how could we implement things that would help the fighters like long-term in long your idea, in your opinion? Long-term um, is just with the fighters union. Like we, we talked about earlier, once you can set in motion this fighters union for the fighters, like I think everybody that's involved in MMA would have a better like future goal plan, you know, because yeah, you have everything, you have the union taking care of stuff. The union will make sure everybody gets paid right. You're not getting underpaid. Mm -hmm. You're going to get all this stuff, you know, and then they, you pay your union dues. They take care of everything. You have your medical, you have retirement because after you fight, like, what are you going to do? Yeah, you know, yeah, unless, yeah. unless you have a 
a good mindset and a good brain, you know, some people, all they know how to do is fight. So after they fight, they're like, that's all I know how to do, you know? Yeah. I, I think that's, that was going to be one of my other questions too. Like, so, you know, what, because you've, you've told me about Japan and stuff before. So, I mean, if you don't mind sharing that information, you know, what, what would you, like, what was the pay difference between the Japan tr promotions versus UFC? And if you can't talk about UFC because you got a non-disclosure agreement, yeah. NDA, uh, yeah, I totally understand. But I'm pretty sure everybody wants to know, you know, what kind of money you'd make. Oh, to me, to me, Japan always paid a lot more. But what it was with the UFC in the beginning part, they used to let you keep your, your sponsors. So that's mm -hmm. why a lot of fighters used to make their money and pay for their training camps and everything. Because the sponsors used to kick in a lot of cash. And then when UFC signed with mm -hmm. the Reebok, that like kind of screwed up all the fighters to like get their sponsorship money, you know? Because the UFC was like, oh, these guys are getting paid more money from their sponsors than they're getting paid to fight. Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, I've, I've sponsored, sponsored tons of fighters too. And, um, you know, you know we, we, I, personally, I'd spend a lot of money on, you know, um, helping them reach that level and, you know, goals with fight camps and, airfares and you know um, just small little things here and there too so and not to mention the knockout bonuses that used to give <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean that's shit i just, i don't make a, everybody thinks i make like a ton of money i don't but i love what i do and i get to write off a lot of stuff involved in just my day-to-day -day, like living you know i get to take friends to lunch and you know, <laughs> squeeze in a few drinks here and there <laughs> true but um yeah it's just an, you know e even me like I've always tried to diversify a portfolio and set things up so I can get a little bit of long money instead of just like, you know, come in quick, kill the game, yeah. make, you know, that, that's, that was my, um, you know, that's, that's my drug dealing thing too. So I like to carry that, that business sense. And when I used to sell dope and stuff, before I got busted, I had nothing to show for it. So, you know, I, I you know, I make good money now and I'm just kind of thinking more long-term. I need to make long-term money. <laughs> Long-term goals, yeah. So hopefully this podcast pops off, man. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Who knows? It, it might though, but. Definitely. It's going to pop off. Yeah. So since you were there in the beginning of UFC, um, shit, I've, you know, I've always been, because I've heard stories from other fighters and stuff, yeah. but they didn't test for steroids. Yeah. They, are, they never tested for steroids back <laughs> in the day. Even with like Pride, Pride never tested for, for any substance because they used to look at it like, even with pro wrestling and Pride, they yeah. used to let all their, their athletes go on the juice because- People used to like seeing muscular guys fighting, you know? Yeah, Big, huge yeah, yeah. guys fighting. Muscular guys, you know? No, Japan has this weird fetish for having <laughs> these really freak show-ish type of matchups that it's just very interesting and entertaining. So I think like even with Japan and stuff, they're, they're you know, they like crazy people to dress up real wild. Even the fashion world too, like Harajuku and... You know, it's just a really exciting and kind of free spirited world, you know, whether it's fashion or, or fighting. Yeah. So I've always thought that was pretty cool about Japan, but yeah, Japan you know. is pretty nuts. When I was up there, I watched um, a fight and Joe Sando, the coach from Kimo Leopoldo was fighting. Mm -hmm. And this was right after he did the, um, the Austin Powers movie where he was the guy with the hat. And oh shit, that guy was a real fighter? Yeah, he came out and fight. He, he used to train chemo, so he, he was fighting there. He came out to fight using like a G-string tutu. <laughs> and like the, the ref was like, no, you need to go back in the stuff. You need to put on a cup, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, you can't fight with that, just that, you know? And I was like, bro, this is what Japan is about. Like putting on <laughs> freak shows, like crazy stuff. Yeah, yeah. So how, how was the treatment though? How did they treat you in Japan compared to the US? Oh, Japan is crazy. They treat you like royalty up there. Like. Like yeah. you got crazy food and said you're in your locker room, you know, for your, yeah, yeah. your teammates and everything, you know, they take care of everything. Like it's no joke up there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so when I went to castle, um, I had in school suspension. Yeah. So, um, you know, they put us in the counselor's office, but, um, you know, the receptionist for the counselor's office was, uh, Miss Rowan, which is actually Chad Rowan's, um, you know, Chad Rowan, um, a football player. No, he was uh, the sumo wrestler. Oh, okay, yeah. So um, he was um, Akibono. Akibono, yeah. yeah, yeah. Konishiki was Jesse Kuhaulua, I guess. I think it was. Like, yeah, they're a little bit older, but yeah, yeah. But you know, she tell me like how how well Japan treats him, and I was like, that's crazy. But 
you know, anytime like, you know, um, people from Hawaii can go to a different country and they're even bigger in that country than they are back home. That, that it always kind of chirped to me out. Yeah. Japan is, a, I, I love living in Japan. I lived in Japan for a year with um, helping Ensign run his gym. Oh yeah. Yeah. Ensign's, uh, you know, um, for everybody that doesn't know it, Ensign runs Pure Breed Gym. Yeah. Is that still going? Is yeah. Pure Purebred Gym is still going in Japan. Mm. And then he has that Yamato Damashi line and he's doing that Destiny Forever bracelets now. Oh, cool. Yeah. cool. Yeah. He, he just, he always seemed like a, a, a businessman, but yo, he, he always seemed like he was thug the fuck out, man. Like take no shit from nobody <laughs> kind of guy. <laughs> but, you know, he's one of those guys that always just seem interesting, but a little scary at the same time. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, compared to Egan, you know, Egan was, you know, um, he, Egan had a very professional feel and top tier athlete too, but more, you know, he's, um, how would you say, just... More laid back. More like, laid back, yeah. So super like professional, you know, like, you know, he doesn't lose his fight and he wants to just fight everybody. And so it was like the serious, like, yeah, take no prisoners type of guy. Totally. Like, if you don't show me respect, I'm going to fuck you up, you know? Yeah. So was he, was he really like that out there in Japan? Yeah. And so it was the same thing. Like, same thing. You don't respect me. I'm going to fuck you up. I seen him like fuck up one of his students where his students joking around with him, like literally beat the shit out of a student for that. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, what the fuck is going on? You know? Yeah. Kind of like that Italian mafia mob boss style. Yeah. You know, but just Japan. So, I mean, you know, I've heard the rumors that Ensign was Yakuza. Is, is there any truth to that? Or, or is he just friends with them? I think I, it's just that he has a lot of friends that are in that, that mm -hmm. position. Because when I was up there, I met a lot of people through him that were affiliated with that. But yeah. Ensign was never affiliated with Yakuza. He just knows a lot of people. He's just friends with them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean... Y Yakuza, you know, I, I, re I read a lot of books and stuff too. So, Yak, even even they they took their um, they took a lot of their Yakuza philosophies and stuff, and you know, um, applied it to business. Which you know, I heard they own a lot of Japan property, like real estate. I heard they're really good businessmen. Yeah, some of like the Yakuza guys, they own like the book factories that print books for the schools. You know, so they <laughs> yeah, have like yeah. they have a set. Stuff so they don't have to have to worry about money. The schools need yeah. books; they're gonna buy the books from them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Japanese are super smart yeah. people. They have a lot of money. I'm part Japanese, by the way, <laughs> but not that smart. Okay, so yeah, I mean, I've you know, I you know, I've heard the steroid stories, and you know how compared to how it is today, and the, you know, the testing that testing is pretty crazy with with steroids nowadays too. So. I was just like, man, that must have been, a, you know, I remember Vitor, Vitor Belford and all of them. And they just looked yoked the fuck out. Like, right. they was just on super, stacks and stacks, dude. Super huge. And before, like, before UFC started getting stricter with the USADA, they used to allow the TRT treatment. So mm -hmm. that used to allow Vitor, being that he used to take steroids before and he couldn't produce all those testosterone, they give you TRT treatment so, mm -hmm. to, so you can start producing your own testosterone. But then oh. once they started doing that and seeing the difference, like, oh, these fighters are getting way more better than they were you know what yeah, I mean? yeah. so they had to make that totally illegal oh okay yeah because i mean definitely um has its physical benefits so i mean but is it does it have it because if you allow everybody to do it then it's kind of one of those things well if you want to take steroids and it, you know enhances your physical abilities um but it doesn't it's it's only unfair when it's not offered to another person you know so you know, if, I don't know. How, how do you feel about steroid use in, in the UFC? Honestly, I used to like when I used to fight muscle guys because I used to be like, ah, this guy's going to gas out super fast, you know? I was hoping like, oh, I hope this guy's on the juice, you know, because he's just going to get super tired, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I used, I used to look at it like, it's, it's a cheating style, you know? A lot of people, mm -hmm. but some people need that edge that mm -hmm. some people don't have, so they got to take that steroids. They got to take that juice. They got to do blood doping to get that extra edge on these other competitors out there yeah, yeah i mean fuck you're getting locked in a fucking cage for you know five minutes at a time and you know you guys are both trying to take each other's heads off so you know any any enhancement right it's just gonna help your game so that's why i don't i don't know why they make marijuana so illegal in the fight you know it'll cause you can relax it doesn't it, it's <laughs> yeah. not gonna make you super strong you know what i mean it's not like popeye spinach yeah <laughs> i don't know anybody that smokes weed 
and starts just like takes a hit of like some good dro or something and just starts bouncing. Go Super Saiyan Sorry, Five. Fuckers. Take, takes a hit of weed and goes Super Saiyan Five like instantly enhances you. You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like fuck, we will smoke on joint and go out and bang. Right. You know what I mean? Most you people just, was like, oh, let's you know, let's smoke a joint and let, you know, let's, let's binge watch Netflix yeah. and sure, order some food. Let's eat some egos. Yeah, totally right. <laughs> So yeah, I mean that's a that's a good point, but I think they just did they just clear that in the UFC now? Yeah, they just started clearing it. So mm-hmm. I guess they do the swab testing. So the swab testing will show if you smoked up to a certain amount of hours before the event. Because mm-hmm. I think they're they're allowing the Olympics to smoke weed now. Oh wow. wow. Yeah. Okay, shit. Um probably Google that later because yeah. I know some smart ass. I'm, I'm not too sure about <laughs> it, but I've I've been hearing things that that's why I've they're trying to push it on USADA. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I, I mean, that's cool. Yeah. Like I said, man, I, I've never thought that weed, uh, you know, was, you know, it's, it's not like alcohol, man. I, you know, I can drink, like I'll drink a 40 or something. And, you know, I, I've had some blackout nights in my time and alcohol was involved. But, you know, when I take edibles, I've, I've never took edibles. I just wanted to go out and, f- you know, just scrap right. fuckers. Have we ever heard about anybody dying from overdosing on marijuana? <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> they go sleep for about a week or eat the whole refrigerator. <laughs> no, but I can give you some edible stories, dude. So, you know, um, it, everything, you know, um, in, in moderation for me, it's, you know, it's a personal thing, personal choice too, you know, whether you smoke weed or eat alcohol or how you party or whatever, you know, as to me, it's always cool as, you know, if you don't hurt anybody, doesn't cost you any money, then uh, fucking green light. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, I had, uh, yeah, I was, I was really interested in, you know, cause I heard from Kumo, I heard uh, the stories about steroids and how, you know, up to on the fight camps, you know, they were just loading up, you know, and they were like just wrecking machines before. So I was just like, oh, okay. That's pretty crazy. Just unbeatable with the steroids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. They were, you know, like, I just, you know, I always bring up Vitor Belfort because he was just on a fucking run. But when he was on the juice, like, nobody was, could stop him. He was him. unstoppable. And when he came off the juice, you see him, he look, whoa, what happened yeah, to him, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then I did hear that, that, that thing about his sister, where the sister got kidnapped. Yeah. And, you know, Brazil is fucking gangster, you know, they... I don't, was it for a fight? You heard about the sister? Yeah, the, I think his sister got kidnapped and I'm not too sure what, but it was right before the fight. And yeah. so he had the shorts that said, you know, he was looking for his sister yeah. and all this stuff. And then I think, I'm not too sure. I think she, they found her dead or something. I think, yeah. yeah, I think she was, they might have decapitated her if I'm yeah. not correct. Yeah. Brazil is crazy though. Yeah, Brazil, they don't give a fuck. Like I watched that show, um, what's it? Um, Something God. City, yeah. City of City God. City of God, dude. Yo, great show too, man. Like Brazil just, is like totally different. Like up here, you you walk in on the streets, like you'll hear construction workers whistling at chicks up there. When you're walking on the streets, like the girls start whistling at you. Oh, like, I oh, did hear that. I heard the girls out there are you know, super like, aggressive. Oh, hey. Yeah. <laughs> Which is cool. So no wonder why all my friends want to fucking go vacation in Brazil, <laughs> dude. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, you know I, always, I always like to ask this, like people this question. If, how, how, so what was your, you know, what was your accolades in fighting? Were you a belt holder? How long did you hold the belt? Or, so you were, um, were you super heavyweight? I was heavyweight. Heavyweight, yeah. okay. Heavyweight, um, fighting at like 265, 270. Um, I held the title for the Honolulu circuit and never lost it for Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Retired the champ from after the organization organization shut down. Yeah, Super Bowl, fuck, people understand, bro. Super Brawl could have, was going up, up and up with UFC, bro. And it's, you know, in, in the early days, I remember um, me and Ikaiko were at the Super Brawl and, you know, Dana White, White was sitting right in front of us. You know, you know, we say, hey, what's up, Dana and stuff. But like, you guys knew him personally, but which was kind of cool for us. Though, yeah, but. It's like Super Brawl is like the launching pad for all the local fighters to get, Fuck, even, totally. even mainland fighters. A lot of people that fought in the Super Brawl Yo. fought in the UFC after yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Jason Miller, all of them. Yeah. Yeah. He, Jake I, Shields, you Jake know. Jake Shields, true, yeah. Tim Sylvia, Justin yeah. Ellers, Travis View. Yeah. So, but you had a fight with um, Tim Sylvia. Yes. So who, who was the toughest motherfucker you fought? Because you fought some tough, dude, you fought some hammers, but 
Who's the toughest guy you fought? The toughest guy I actually fought, like person besides myself was Andre Alosky. Oh, he had, dude. he just, at the time when I fought him, I took the fight five minutes notice, you know, and he just had, he was ready for the title. You know, he was hungry. He had a lot of movement, you know. Oh, he was on a fucking run. Bro. Yeah. Arlovsky was on a run. He was on a run. Yeah. But to me, honestly, my toughest opponent was myself just by not training and just not taking it seriously, thinking that, ah, I can beat this guy by not even <laughs> yeah. training, you know? Total local boy attitude. Ah, fuck him, bro. We're going bang. Yeah. And now it's like totally different. Now running and keeping my diet down. I'm like, this is what I should have been doing all the time. I never <laughs> did see a 225 pound cabbage before, you know? <laughs> yeah, true, dude. So, um, so who, you know, what was your most fun fight though? You know, like my funnest fight was, um, against Sean Alvarez in the UFC. Cause a lot of people had doubts on me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, even my trainer, Egan, you know, I had doubts in me, you know, he didn't <laughs> yeah. want to even like the guy that was with the other guy wanted to bet him and he didn't even want to bet, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I was like, wow. <laughs> okay. So well, I, I think, I think for, you know, all, mostly all trainers, like, you know, if you're a trainer or a, and manager, you, you know, you want to pick fights for your fighters that they have, you know, a, a, a better chance of winning yeah. too. So, so, I mean, Egan was probably, you know, he thought he was looking out for you, yeah. but fucking young cab just wanted to bang. How old were you? Uh, at I, that time? I was 24 Four in the UFC. Yeah. That's why like right after that fight, I was like, yeah, to everybody that had my back. Thank you guys. Everybody that doubted me, fuck you guys. You know, and everybody yeah. started going nuts in the arena. Oh yeah. 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 That's a, that's a, you know, that's another thing too. Everybody thinks that Conor McGregor is, you know, he started this, this, this bad, bad boy of MMA and this whole hype train of, of, and he was really good at it. It's part of, you know, it's part of his, how he marketed himself as a fighter too, but I'm pretty sure you were the first bad boy of MMA and you had, um, you actually had the first <laughs> rumble in the, <laughs> rumble in the octagon. Yeah. Yeah. First, first like big riot that happened in the octagon. We had like people from the crowd jumping in the cage, you know, yeah, yeah. I was, was just, well, what the fuck's going on? You know, at the yeah. time I was like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, just, but like, just think if you could go back in time, you know, and, and you knew that, you know, you could get in your opponent's heads the way that, you know, um, McGregor exposed everybody too. Yeah. So would you implement that into your, cause every, yeah, everybody's like, oh, Pilar, I fucking get shitty sportsmanship. And that's what it really was back then. Everybody's like, you're a fucking bad sport. You're a, um, you know, you're bad for the, uh, you're bad for the sport. For the organization. The organization, yeah. Like, like they were saying that when I did, when the riot with Tank Abbott. Yeah, yeah. Like Joe Rogan was saying, this is bad for the sport, but in the video, you only see me doing the cabbage patch and throwing the finger. You don't show, they don't show Tank Abbott's guy showing me the finger and throwing a water bottle at me before I stuck finger. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like, they made me look like the bad guy. And then I was like, I'll own it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, fuck it, bro. I know how to be bad too. I remember Tito used to always grumble with me because Tito, the first time I swore on TV, Tito was like, bro, I wanted to be the first one to swear on, on pay-per-view. You know, you fuck, he did it. Yeah, he beat you too. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I beat you. Yeah, yeah um, Tito's, his finishing move was that the grave digger thing yeah. too. Yeah, so. Dig the grave, drag him into the grave and stomp yeah. on him. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, wait, that was with, who did he do that with? Frank Shamrock? With Frank and then. Every single one of his fights was was that he used oh, to yeah, do the yeah. grave digger. Well, who's a, so who's the first guy he he did the grave digger move with? Jeez, I think it was um was it Guy Metzger when he fought? Oh. I think he fought Guy Metzger before he fought Frank, that's why. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh crap, man. It just shows how old I am, but whatever. <laughs> 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 yeah, I remember when um when you know when jujitsu just came to Hawaii, um what's his Helsin was teaching jujitsu at UH and it was ten dollars a class and you know i was like ah you know my my good friend todd went and he went to it you know and he came you know i was like oh let me see what you learn you know it's kind of shame too yeah so he showed me a couple of his moves and stuff and you know um i was like in in the very beginning of usc and stuff i was like man i gotta fucking add this to my fight game too <laughs> it's, a, it's Ground game is a, jujitsu is a crazy advantage, but if you learn that, you know. Yeah, especially early on, you yeah. know. That's why, um, I'm, fuck, BJ was on a fucking run too, you know. And that that was my favorite, B my favorite BJ was the BJ that used to go in the ring, take guys down and take their arm home, you know what I mean? Oh, or take yeah. their neck home, you know. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and she'd be like, yeah, that's the B, that's the BJ that UFC signed for, you know, the BJ yeah, that yeah. was the first non-Brazilian to win the moon jaw, you know, the yeah, first black yeah. belt, you know, he had so much jujitsu claims and, and medals. Yeah, yeah. Yo. And that was early on before everybody really knew yeah. about jujitsu too. And he just, you know, he smashed a lot of Brazilians. At like their, you know, every their time he, he enforced his jujitsu, when he fought Joe Stevenson, when he fought um, Jens Pover, when he took the back, locked the arm down and just started talking shit to him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Hi, hey boy. What you going to do now, boy? You know what I mean? Just started <laughs> popping him in the face with a, with a thumb knuckle, you know, and then slipped the choke on. Yeah, dude. That was, yeah, dude. When BJ used to win fights like that, man. We all felt like we won in Hawaii. Right? We were like, yeah, you fuck. Yeah, and he used to come out to um, Brother Is. And yeah, man, BJ's a legend. He had a fucking And I think when he fought Matt right? Hughes, he came out to um, the Phil Collins. <laughs> oh, no way, dude. <laughs> oh, shit, dude. Um, was that, um, it, was, it was real popular on this, um, like a drug dealing movie too, but. Uh, I, forget, I forget the name of the song, but it was a Phil Collins song. Yeah, I know which one too. But that was cool. I mean. You and um, you and BJ were super close before too, and you know, like guys are both from Hilo, so like, how was that? You know, coming from such a small town, and I live in Hilo now too, and Hilo is still, you know, um, you know, Hilo is Oahu, even though the internet, the internet changed a lot of things, but Hilo is Oahu, you know, twenty years ago, yeah, fifteen, twenty years ago, like it just kind of stayed. Small and country, everybody knows who's dating who, right. and, which sucks and it's weird. But, um, you know, how, how was it, you know, being small little, you know, hometown heroes and just traveling? You guys traveled the world together. Yeah, we traveled the world. And for me, coming from my, my dad and mom used to work, but we weren't rich, you know what I mean? So when I hit that UFC and I got famous, like it didn't change me at all because I was still that grounded person that I was before I even got into the UFC. You know, I still used to go check out the places that I used to check out before I went, mm -hmm. got into the UFC. I still used to go check out my friends in Lanaquila projects, you know, <laughs> you know, go check out all my friends. And I never did change. I always broke bread with the same people I, I broke bread with before I got famous because yeah. it was just, my dad always taught me, just got to be yourself. You know, you cannot fake, fake the funk. You cannot change your way to be anybody else, you know? Yeah. yeah. Did you guys, so... Man, because he's still getting, you know, everybody just, hey, you know, like when I hang out with you, it's like, bro, is that cabbage? Oh, cabbage. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like just the other day too, you know, we were at um, that shopping center in Waimea and we said, oh, cabbage. I was like, oh, bro, who was that? You know that guy? No, <laughs> dude. <laughs> A lot of people just see me and they'll be like, hey, cabbage, how you doing? Yeah. And I'll be like, hey, what's up? How you doing? You know, shake their hand. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, coming from like, um. Uh, like a like you know of the world stage of fighting on the yeah. UFC and stuff. So, and coming back home, so with all the money that you made, you know, you made some decent money out there. You know, um, what would you do differently? What would you know? Because I I can only imagine you're 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 young. You're yeah. in your twenty early twenties. Or oh, just you know you making partying right now when you get that money. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like. You guys want to go fucking, let's go on a trip. Let's go. You know, you get so much money. You don't know what to do with it. Yeah. I but mean, I could change one thing. I do a lot of investing now. Yeah. yeah. Like stock market investing or? Stock market and investing in myself. Like mm -hmm. just trying to build something up for something long-term. Oh, okay. Like a, like a start a business or yeah, something. Yeah. Like something to start, like put some money on the side. That way after you're done fighting, you have something to sit on and you can start something up from there. Yeah. Let, you know, how most people say, yeah, let that, let the money make itself at that point. Once you've, you know, made a. A decent amount of it. But at the time, you're not thinking. You're just fighting. You're getting that money. You're oh, like, I'm totally, going to spend this. Totally. You know? And then you get some promoters that will give you a check. And then they'll give you cash. And then so you get the cash. And you're like, are we going to party tonight? You know, oh, you got like five know. grand to, to spend tonight. You know, like, yeah, let's go. Take the boys out. Yeah. I, mean, I used to do the same thing too. But I was getting, um, I was getting cash a different way. <laughs> and the, those same guys, though, that you treat and take them out, that stuff. Now, now you try to call them to barbecue. And they're like. Oh yeah. Crickets. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Like, what happened to these guys? Yeah. It, it, that's a weird thing. I mean, it comes with the fame and the success, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've, I've seen that happen before too. Even, even myself on a personal level, but you know, there's, there's, you know, no matter what, even like, even when I was locked up, you know, you can't take away my memories yeah. and I had some fucking great <laughs> memories too. So, you know, no regrets, man. So yeah. 
there's but, no regrets. Like UFC, I had fun. Like there's a lot of stuff. Like if it wasn't for fighting, I wouldn't have traveled half of like, yeah. where I went, you know? Yeah, I think. And just talking story and getting to be friends with the Fertitas and Dana White, you know? Yeah, crazy, crazy. <sighs> yeah, well, are they billionaires yet? Well, guaranteed it. So the Fertitas, they own like all the station casinos and they were mm-hmm. known um, like Gordon Biersch before. Mm-hmm. So before there was a UFC gym, there was actually the UFC office where the gym was downstairs. Yeah. And they used to, they used to bring like all their favorite fighters over there to train. So I like, I trained there with like Alex Gong. They know I brought Alex Gong for me to train with like, oh, that's Chuck cool. would be down there, Tito would be down there. But that was like the UFC gym before there was like a before UFC gym. The, yeah. yeah. I think, you know, I think, you know, um, UFC, UFC hit this, um, this level of success when, you know, they did the ultimate fighter show. Yeah. And that just skyrocketed them, you know, and, you know, they were, after that, they were pretty much unstoppable because, especially with the Fertitas involvement, because they had a lot of money, they had a lot of capital to work with. And they started buying out the other organizations. Yeah, yeah. dude, I was so, like, Pride was my, my thing, dude. I love Pride. You know, I was like Sakuraba fan and, you know, I just, I just really liked those wild <laughs> Japanese freak show fights. Pride was crazy. First round is 10 <laughs> minutes and after that you got two fives after oh, that. Oh yeah, yeah, dude, that was nuts. So I was like, holy sh-. Or when like, yeah. Vice Grace used to fight and there was no time limit. I was like, oh yeah. What in the world is going on here? Yeah, dude. Till somebody dies, right? fuck. <laughs> but yeah. Two men enter, one man leave. <laughs> dude, and there's like, that, uh, was it Saitama or? What's the uh, arena that? Saitama. Saita, pff, the super arena. Oh, dude, that thing is packed shoulder to shoulder. And I was just like, you know, I don't always, I'm like I'm a business guy too. Yeah. So I was thinking, okay, man, how, how, how many people are there? What's, you know, what did they, what were they making? And, you know, the I tried to prices. Yeah. Like, I just run that shit in my head. Like, okay, their overhead must've been this. You got staging lighting, you know, uh, marketing. And, but, you know, I, I was still thinking they were making hundreds of millions of dollars with the pride. The oh, pride. Definitely. And did they buy out K1? Because that's my other favorite fight promotion. Dude. No, K1 actually stayed, stayed by itself. They still have K1. Oh, they still have yeah. K1. It's just not promoted? Or? Yeah, it's hardly. Um, I think they changed it to Glory now. It's Glory, Glory Kickboxing. Oh, okay. So, I mean, how come they, ch- you know, like I, I run brands myself. So, you know, K1 had a name. So why would you change? Why would you go from K1 to Glory? Maybe, um, I don't know if what happened, but could be a possibility of a whole bunch of things that could have filtered down to it being yeah. changing. Maybe they got partnerships, right yeah, partnerships. So, oh, yeah. they split. So now the one guy that wants to keep running and the one guy that wants to dig out, he doesn't want anything to do, but he owns the name. He's like, nope, yeah, you gotta yeah, make your yeah. own thing. Yeah, that could be it. So um, so how do you feel about this new, I love it, um, Bare Knuckle, the Bare Knuckle fight league i think bare knuckle is a, is the newest thing on the fight market right now it's so crazy you know because it, it really turns into skills of striking you know it doesn't turn into if you can take this guy down let me hold him down for yeah. five minutes yeah and it has to be like perfectly placed punches because one wrong punch you break your hand you break your hand yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah oh yeah i mean so i like i like watching that shit you know we sponsored um kendall too yeah shout out to kendall man um but, you know, we, we, I sponsored a couple guys in that thing. And I was thinking, man, this thing is going to f- take off. It's fucking action-packed. It's, you know, I like the whole fight game because, you know, I, I did jujitsu too. So yeah. I enjoy watching the clinics that some of these fighters put on, you know, jujitsu clinics that they put on with other fighters and stuff too. So I do enjoy that because I know what's going on. But, you know, like, you know, my girlfriend was like, ah, this is boring. Or, so bloody. <laughs> yeah. Or, oh, this is boring. All they're doing is hugging each other and stuff, you know. But, you know, when you get rocked in bare knuckle, man, you can't, like, you can't really clinch up oh, too, yeah? yeah? You're, going, you're going down. You kind of clinch. You kind of take the guy down, you know? Yeah. There's no kicking, no kneeing. Yeah. So, shoot, bro. You got to learn. You got to really know how to cut lines and stuff. But, you know, um. What's his face? I, I thought he was gonna. I thought he was gonna beast it, but he didn't really do that good. Um, what's his name? Magli. Um, oh, Magnolani, the boxer. Magnolani. Yeah. yeah. Did I watch that at your house? Yeah, we watched <laughs> yeah. it at my house. So, so yeah, and I, I was thinking, oh fuck, he's, this this gonna be bloody. He's doing some smash fuckers. What I think is with with boxers being that your regular boxer. Mm-hmm. Being your hands is in a glove with more wraps. I think that you're more cautious when you're fighting bare knuckles because you have more wraps on your hands when you're using the glove compared to. Fighting bare knuckle. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's you're you're guaranteed to break fingers yeah. then almost. Yeah. Break fingers, break break knuckles. You know. 
Yeah. Like when Crazy Horse fought his first fight, bare knuckles, he broke both his hands in the first fight. I was like, <laughs> throwing crazy punches. That's why. Yeah. So I mean, do, what would you? So what would you add to bare knuckle to make it a little bit safer, but not? You're not switching it up. Would you allow a little bit better hand wraps or like wrist or? I, I like the hand wraps that they do right now because mm -hmm. you're allowed to wrap your wrist. You just, um, you have to stay an inch or two away from your knuckles. Mm -hmm. So you can still wrap your hand to make your hand solid. So it doesn't mm -hmm. like, because your hand has so much bones inside of it. It's easy to break. Yeah, shit, fuck. I'm I, I, oh, always broke. My pinkies, my, my fucking fingers are fucked up. I, I think that just bare knuckle is just a great, it's, it's pretty much a great platform already to, for people that are done with MMA and just want to box, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and it's going to start, <laughs> it's going to turn way bigger than what it is right now. Like Shaq's trying to jump in with it right now. Yeah. That's what, I, you know, I was wondering, like, why isn't it growing bigger than the UFC? Because like I said, um, it's, it's action packed from fucking start to finish. Yeah. It, it you know, it finishes, it, most likely it's going to finish with, a knockout. Yeah, you're gonna get or a knockout a stoppage, in yeah. you know, or, or injury stoppage. So it's <laughs> pretty fucking violent. <laughs> it's the violence right there. Yeah, but that pe drives people fucking crazy and it's super attractive yeah, too. You know, and then you got pretty girls fighting inside there and the pretty girls come in pretty oh, and they leave busted dude. up, you know, it's like, what happened to you? Yeah, pay, yeah. Shout Shit. out to Paige, Good, great fight, Paige. Yeah, dude, she's gorgeous. Keep your head too. up. <laughs> So you watched that because it wasn't that like this past weekend or? Yeah, that was last this past week? weekend. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was going to come to your house in Waimea, but you just got caught up. But so did she get fucked up? Um, she kind of got outclassed. Like the girl was real hungry. Oh, Bethany yeah. Hart, she was real hungry. She was like, you don't belong here. Either. She was she was mad because they gave Paige a shot from just coming from the UFC, you know? Oh, okay, okay, okay. And she was just like, how are you going to come to my, my, my sport and they're going to give you all this treatment that I was here longer, you know? Yeah, yeah. So well, I think she had something to prove. Like, Brettany yeah. Hart had something to prove when she fought Paige. Well, I mean, you know, she she brought viewers. Every, you, know, or, you know, she's a very attractive girl. Yeah. But also, you know, she has really big following. So people are very interested to see how she was going to, how, how well she was doing that fight promotion, the bare knuckle one. Her movement was great. She had great movement, but just the yeah. other girl was just way, because you figure Paige never fought bare knuckles before. She did yeah. Taekwondo and MMA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you take those gloves off, it's when, when you get punched from somebody without a glove and you get a knuckle in the eye, mm. it'll change your whole look out of life. You know what I mean? You're <laughs> yeah. like, oh, what happened? Everybody thinks they have a plan to get punched right. in the you face punched with in the bare face. knuckles. Like, like I used to say the same thing, like when I used to fight black belts, yeah. Every single time I punch them, their belt level goes down. You know, they go brown, yeah. black, brown, purple, white. <laughs> you know? Every single time you punch them, their belt level drops. Yeah, they go from uh, black belt to rubber yeah. in one hit. Uh. Every time they try on takedown, you give them a boop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shit, I mean, we don't, we don't see, like, you know, I like Muay Thai too. But we don't see, we don't see the level of promotion, like huge Muay Thai promotions. Muay Thai is a... A great fucking sport. Very exciting. It's very fun to watch and stuff too. But, you know, we don't see that in uh, America or, you know, we, still, we don't see these big stages for Muay Thai. And, yeah. How come? I'm, I'm not too sure why, but in Thailand, Muay Thai is huge. Like oh, if yeah, you go yeah, in yeah. Cambodia, they got the old school Muay Thai fights with the rope on their hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, but, and, that, and that's the thing, you know, it's like, I, I'll go, I got to watch it on the internet, but you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's something like, you know, like a lot of Hawaiians would, you know, you know, crack that pay-per-view and, you know. Right, watch it. <laughs> yeah. I don't, know if, I don't know if because Usada, maybe there's a different bunch of rules because like, let's take for instance with Pride and UFC. Yeah. yeah. With Pride, you could soccer kick, stomp, but you yeah. couldn't knee on the ground. No, yeah, you could yeah. knee on the ground. UFC, you cannot soccer kick. But you can knee standing up, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. But you couldn't knee on the ground. You couldn't mm -hmm. soccer kick in UFC. But Pride, you could. You could jump off the rope <laughs> yeah. and stomp the guy in the chest. You know what I mean? In Pride. Yeah. I mean, shit. I. I mean, I, I've seen. Uh, I've seen some pretty amazing fence fucking um, fence jump offs, right? Bro. What was that? Um, Benson. Yeah. 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 Showtime. Showtime Pettis against oh, Benson. Yeah, 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 that yeah, was like yeah. the, the highlight reel of the century, right? And he jumped off the fence and kicked him and dropped Benson totally, Henderson. Totally, bro. And Ben, you know, he, he was on a run too at that at that time too. Yeah. So that was, you know, that was real. Super cool to watch. Okay, so um 
I mean, do you have any, you know, because we brought up the injury thing. Do you have any injuries that you, you sustained back in your UFC or Super Bowl days that, you know, still bug you today or? You, honestly, or nothing. Really? Like, I see people that fought the same time as me and they get like hard time getting out of bed. I'm like, I get out of bed oh, super yeah. fast. You know, I, I heal. Like my son used to call me like when I fought Andre Alaski. We're both in the bathroom. He's brushing his teeth. I look at my black eye and it's peeling a little bit. I'm like, what yeah. the? I peel my black eye off. He looks at me and he's like, I knew you were a superhero. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's fool. That's fucking part of and peel his black eye off. Really? Like, what the <laughs> hell? How do you get rid of your black eye? <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, with, you know, with all the, you know, with the fame and, and all that crap from the UFC, being very famous and, you know, well known for, for fighting, do you, do you feel like, it, you know, some of that, you know, the negativity or, you know, now, now people see you in the streets and they're like, ah, fucking, I lick that fuck up. You know, did you have any of that? I never did have that. I only used to have guys like when I used to go to the clubs being like, oh, how can I fight? I like try to fight you instead of stuff. I thought, bro, you got to work your way up. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you do the same thing I did. I'm not trying to give up no free passes this way. You, know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. you yeah. put in the same amount of work as I did and you can fight me after. <laughs> Cause I mean, like we don't see you on TMZ fighting, beating up bouncers and stuff too. Right. So I was just like, ah, but you know, but you're, you're a bigger guy too. And so, you know, I was thinking, ah, fuck, I don't really see anybody, you know, challenging you on that level out there in the streets, but you know, you're, you're, you're pretty humble and you're always smiling and showing, throwing shockers to everybody too. But you know, once in a while you gotta have that young punk that's like, ah, fuck him, da da da, you know, just, it's all the rubber fuckers, you yeah. know what I mean? That's the one that you just give them the paw one time, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. But yeah, we, I, I've never saw that with you. So, I mean, um, you know, I, 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 I know you're, you like weed. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and, you know, I guess we kind of touched up on the whole UFC and the whole weed thing. But, you know, for all my, um, my weed fans out there, they probably want to know, so. What's your favorite strain? Oh, my favorite strain. Jeez, I got a bunch of my, my favorite is the cookies. I like the cookie strain, the lemon cookies. Lemon cookies. Yeah. I like the, the wedding cake, the blue wedding dream. Cake. Dude, I think yeah. wedding cake, um, yeah, probably like the most popular strain in, in the past year. Cause now everybody, you know, there's wedding cake crosses. And yeah. as, as long as they cross it with wedding cake, man, it's shoot. It's a pretty bomb strain, huh? Oh, that's cool. That's cool. So if you could only s smoke one fucking strain for a year or oh, two strains, pick two. Two strains. I'm going to pick oh, wedding cake and wedding cake. <laughs> gotta be the wedding cake and the cookies. The lemon cookies gotta be the lemon cookies. Cookies, yeah. Fuck. I mean, that's, it's kind of cool, man. This whole, this whole turn with, um, you know, with, with, with weed and, and it's, it's, you know, it's not, we're not full wreck here in Hawaii, but, you know, they've decriminalized weed, you know, um, a lot. You know, I was, I was in prison with a lot of people that sold weed and stuff too. And, you know, it's just, it's, I mean, I guess it can be addictive, but like, you know, I, I don't, I personally don't know people that were breaking fucking car windows to get your stereo to go so Buy for a twenty dollar yeah. bag of herb. I need that you know? wedding cake, man. You know what I mean? Damn. Like I, I stole my mom's fucking. <laughs> yeah, I just amped my mom's wedding ring for some wedding cake. For <laughs> ate the wedding cake, homie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and I've never. Yeah, dude, I've because I I had people like amp stuff with me when I was back into that in the day with you know jewelry and weapons and tools and stuff, right. you know. And I sold weed too. And, and the EBT, yeah, <laughs> they come with yeah. a paper EBT, giving yeah. you the booklets. <laughs> yeah. But I've, you know, for, cause I sold weed too. And, um, you know, I never had anybody trying to just trade me, uh, you know, like gats or, or power drills and stuff <laughs> for weed, you know, shit. Most of the had is what? Can cut your yard or what? I can get on $20 bag if I cut your yard. <laughs> yeah. Go right ahead. There's less yard work I got to do oh, here. Yeah. Oh, but with the other stuff, man, they, they wash my car, man, you know, um, do all kind of wild shit for me. Before. I, had, I had guys painting the underneath of my lifted <laughs> truck with a paintbrush before. 
shit. I'd, yeah, dude, I'd, I'd make them do some pretty funny stuff. Some weird shit. Like, oh, here, paint that underneath my whole truck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here, uh, ch- ch- trim my uh, yard with this pair of scissors. <laughs> Just to laugh and see, like, what, how far would they go yeah. for it, you know? Like, I was, yeah, I don't do that kind of shit now, but I was kind of asshole, you know, when I was young. <laughs> But, you know, you just give a, you know, just give a young kid that never had shit all this money and <laughs> it just goes wild, though. Yeah. I guess it just comes with the territory. Um, so, you know, other than, um, you know, other than fighting, which was actually a career, so it wasn't a hobby. What kind of hobbies do you have? Um, I like to do a lot of stuff. So, oh, what did I like to do besides smoke herb? <laughs> Hang with my friends, spend time with my kids, go to the beach, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's, that's kind of the, um, that's the Wesley Cabbage career of today. His yeah. hobbies is, you know, hanging out with his kids and just doing mellow stuff. So, you know, no, no training for fights or anything like that right now? No, I just, I train every morning still. Yeah, I still run five miles every morning. Just, okay, just, just in condition. Keep, yeah, keep in shape and still punch back a little bit and stuff, move around. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's cool, man. Um, you know, um, just because we hang out and stuff, you know, I know you're, you're a toy collector, which, I, you know, I tell everybody because, you know, I'll put in my Instagram story once in a while, you know, some of the stuff that you get from me, yeah. Yeah, like the, um, the Funkos and stuff. And I'm just like, yo, Cap, give me this one. Let's check this shit out. It's pretty sick. And then, who, who gave that to you? Cabbage, Wesley Cabbage Korea, the <laughs> UFC guy? fuck you doing collecting toys? He collects toys? He collects this shit? <laughs> I was like, dude, he's heavy into it. You know, like. You can never know what you come across, you know? <laughs> he, you know, yeah, I tell people, yeah, sometimes, man, he, he'll just, he go into GameStop and, you know, or, or I shouldn't talk about where you find all your secret pickups, you know, but, you know, you'd find all these little pickups and stuff and show me that shit and, you know, um, you'd resell it too. I was just like, oh, how much did you get for that little fucking thing? That's wild, man. Right, it's just a come up. Like sometimes you you, you score, you know what I mean. You yeah. hit the jackpot once in a while. Yeah. So you collect a lot of them, but you know you you dabble in um in, in resale too. Yeah, for the oh, okay, okay. So um again for you know people that collect out there and you know um follow my podcast or my Instagram. Um, I will leave Cabbage's uh, Instagram. So if you guys collect toys and you got questions about. You know, um, what, what what do you collect the most of? Uh, whatever. Like, I just look for whatever is collectible at the time. I like collecting what I used to have before as kids. So Transformers, G.I. Joes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just started getting into comics again. Like, I scored a killer comic. Like, I couldn't oh. believe on the comic book. We got to do the journey on the comic pretty soon. Yeah, dude. I've, I got I to gotta follow you around. And um, when you go get it priced and stuff, it's, we got to go do that comic thing. Because he brought in this comic. Um, It was a... When, when the fuck is that from? 1930s? Uh, 19, 40s? 1938 Action Comics number one. It's like the grail of comic books that like what started all the superheroes. It's mm-hmm. like the first appearance of Superman. Mm-hmm. And then so, you know, you found that um, cleaning house and it's, uh, shit, I didn't even want to touch it, dude. He brought it <laughs> over this morning. He's like, check this shit out, dude. This is the one. This is the one. And I was just like, you know, I put my hands in my pocket, dude. <laughs> I don't want to touch it. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh yeah, that shit looks legit, dude. That shit's crazy. But I ain't fucking touching it, dude. But um, yeah. So what are you doing with that comic right now? I know you you wanted to get it. Um, I'm waiting for this whole um, COVID thing to get done with and I can send it out to get graded. Because oh, once you get the graded, comic graded the, the value goes up when you get a like a good grade because then that'll show that it's, actually a real comic, not a forgery or mm-hmm. not a reprint. Yeah, I, I collected comics as a kid too. So acid free boards and yeah, I had the whole nine and the fuck did I do it? My, oh, well, I lost uh, half of my comic collection to one of my exes. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like you're in a relationship and you just want out or whatever. And you're just like, ah, fuck it. Dude, I wish I had those. I had some really, you know, um, the X Factors, I had, you know, started from one, I had X Factor. I was, you know, I was heavily into Marvel and, but I've been, you know, I collected comics when I was a kid too, cause there was a comic book store in Kailua. Yeah. And my grandpa had a coin shop. So, you know, I collect coins too, but I was, you know, I like drawing and stuff. So I was always more, you know, um, attracted to comics, even though like, 
you know, my grandpa had, you know, this whole uh, coin store that he made, you know, a pretty decent living, you know, buying and selling coins and stuff. I was just like, you know, coins are, is like, oh, it's cool. But, you know, they're like, but, but <laughs> yeah, but Wolverine, you know, he got these fucking, um, these blades, adamantium blades that come out of his stuff. He just fuck you up with that you know what I mean and just had the good comics back then you know <laughs> yeah like me I'm a Marvel guy but when I got that DC comic I was like shit this is like the gold mine like, yeah I better, I better take care of this baby yeah so I mean hopefully man hopefully you can get that shit graded I'm yeah COVID put a fucking huge damp and um pause on you know a lot of people's personal lives um business it just you know like it was kind of COVID was wasn't you know um actually I know pe more people that that COVID killed their business their family members too but you know you should definitely um you know be very careful when um around you know people that are overweight and you know are kapuna you know you know mask up and you know keep your distance and stuff because I mean you never know but to me, that's just the only demographic that I feel on a, you know, personally that, you know, um, we should keep safe, you know, but, you know, if you're in, you know, if you're in fairly decent health, man, I think you should, you know, going out, wearing a mask or not, it, it, should, it's, it should always be a very, um, you know, it's up to you, personal, you know, I hate that, you know, when once the government steps in, they keep on, you know, mandating and making you do a lot of things and, it's kind of one of those things that it just never ends. You know, it starts here. That's going to be this. Then, you know, then we're going to have to wear those fucking body suits with fingers in them and shit. And remember when the, the old norm was like, you used to walk to the store and forget your wallet in the car or your phone. Now everybody walks to the store and mask. Like, oh, I forgot my mask. You yeah. gotta walk back to your car, put your mask on now. <laughs> I do that so much. That's why I actually, well, I make masks. That's another thing too. You know, I, I make masks with my clothing brands and stuff. So I make masks and I sell masks and stuff, but um, I'm not going to, you know, just, you know, I'm not going to pump that fear out there so I can get more sales. I always, you know, I was, we, we were doing masks before it was even a popular thing to do because you know, it's a hygiene thing. Um, I used to travel a lot too. So I just mask up and wear into the airports and stuff. Cause you know, in, 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 I don't know if it's true, but in my head, I felt like it kept me from getting sick a lot because I'd be stuck in these planes with, you know, a lot of people and with uncle uh, auntie coughing a storm yeah, right next to you. Dude. You know, or these or these kids just like sneezing and I just be like, oh, okay, fuck. I always take airborne and stuff, <laughs> dude. Every trip bro, I took airborne and my my mask and stuff. But now it's a thing where it's mandatory. And I don't know. And fuck anytime anytime something becomes mandatory and forced, I'm just like Fuck that. I just don't want Fuck to do the it. system. Yeah. Even if I wore it before, but now I'm forced to wear it, I don't want to wear it. Yeah. You know? so, I don't know. That's, a, yeah, that's the weird thing about <laughs> this whole mask thing. But yeah, that's just, that's probably, you know, I think, I personal think, issue. I think this whole COVID stuff killed more small businesses than it did people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I think so too, man. But, you know, I don't want to be, um, you know, I don't want to be rude to people that have lost family members, yes. you know, but shoot, there's people don't realize the, you know, the, the flip side of not just COVID and, and, you know, people getting sick from the virus, but you know, the mental health and yeah. domestic, domestic abuse that was, you know, attached to just being stuck and locked at home. Cause you know, people drive each other <laughs> crazy. So now from spending like eight hours with each other and now you're spending 24 hours with each other because yeah. both you guys aren't working, you guys are stuck at home. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, like I said, man, just it only, it, COVID really only affected middle to lower class. People with a lot of money, which is the people that push the whole COVID. Yeah, stay at home, stay at home. It must be nice because you, you, know, you got a big ass fucking yard. Right. You got a pool. You know, you, you and your kids are doing cool ass shit at home. You know, and, but, you know, a lot of people, especially in Hawaii, they don't, you know, we like to go out and then, you know, um, okay, so we can't go to work. So we, we like go holo. Yeah. Go fishing, diving and stuff. And you can't even do that. You know, and, you know, people weren't talking about, you know, about the vitamin D and, and um, 
you know, staying healthy and physically fit, you know, they weren't talking about that. Everybody's just talking about vaccine, wait for the vaccine, wait for the vaccine. Yeah. But, you know, um, I mean, studies have shown that, you know, if you're phys in good physical condition, which is going to the gym, going um, hunting and diving and stuff and staying physically active kept you at a, you know, you're on a better percentage and for, for not just mortality, but just from being not infected, but, you know, surviving, yeah. surviving COVID. Because I do know several people that um, have tested positive for it, but then again, um, you know, what are they testing for? Because the funny thing is, you know, COVID deaths are up, but influenza is almost zero now. So how the fuck is influenza just going to disappear? We've had, we had the common flu for centuries, centuries yeah. right? Yeah, since, since, since mankind was, you know, living. But now it's just zero. <laughs> like, where did it go? Hmm. Got to think about something that fishy. Shit. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I need something. So, um, yeah, you, you've recently moved from Hilo to Waimea, which is kind of cool because I like, you know, I tell people, I tell all my Wahoo friends and stuff too. Yeah, it's like, dude, you know, um, Waimea is the, uh, it's the, um, it's the port locking. <laughs> and, and um diamond head of big island yeah so everybody talks about white man it's like so beautiful yeah. it's like god's country they call it, it. yeah it is man or, or after waimanalo waimanalo is truly god's country yeah. <laughs> it's, it's cold down from my it's yeah, cold as hell though in white man <laughs> it is dude yeah. but shit i like it man yeah uh, you know I, I enjoy that you know people are always like oh man how do, how'd you just move from you know, um, uh, Oahu to, to Big Island is super country, but, <laughs> you know, I love it, man. That's, you know, you know, less anxiety and, you know, I just get to hold up. I got a, a, a cool little piece of property that <laughs> I live right down the road from the beach. Well, there's no beaches over here. It's cliffs, but <laughs> the ocean, I live right down the road from the ocean. I still like to just go throw poles down there and stuff and, it, you know, it wasn't, it made it easier. It made the transition, you know, away from um, Oahu and stuff easy. But, you know, Oahu got cool restaurants and I got, you know, a lot of friends over there. Yeah. Too. Less, you know, a lot less friends on, on Big Island. But, eh, when I was. More stuff we'll do. We yeah. Go hunt, we go Mauna. Yeah, totally. We check out the lava flow. Yeah, I mean, I go check out the lava flow and then I go. Up to Mauna Kea and check out the snow in the right. same goddamn what, what day. Are, what other what island we can go check out the lava flow, fire and ice in the same yeah. day, you know? None. None island. We're so lucky we live on a big island. Yeah, totally. But okay, I mean, shoot, we've done this podcast. This is like first, the first official podcast I did with uh, Wesley Cabbage Korea. And, you know, we're, we're at uh, an hour right now. So, um, I mean, do you want to tell your, your, any shout outs or, or, or what kind of, are you doing any business or is there anything you wanted to tell our listeners? So I'm moving out to Waimea. I moved out to Waimea. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start a women's and children's self-defense classes out there. Okay. Okay. So I'm just, I'm just trying to fill up, get everything else in motion. And as soon as I get more information about it, I'm going to, I'm going to let everybody know on social media and start putting flyers around, but that's my main goal. I just want to create awareness for females and ladies, just, you know, to be able to protect themselves when they need to. Cause my thing is like maybe eight out of 10, 10 females will have mace in their purse, but how many of those eight people know how to use it or how many of them will run instead of using it, you know? And maybe hopefully after that thing takes off, open up like a regular gym to train older guys and teenagers. Okay, cool. But my thing is just to create the awareness, like I said, for the females and the kids. So yeah. Nobody gets taken. To, or, or fuck, I mean, there's this like, bullying is popular nowadays, yeah. man. That sucks. There's dude, I hate so, fucking There's bullies. so much simple things that kids can learn that can stop people from bullying them around. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So much, so much things, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I switched schools a lot growing up too. So my thing was like, every time I went to a new school, it's just fucking swing. I used to hate bullies growing <laughs> up. Like there's always bullies. Me being a, a short, fat kid, you know what I mean? Growing up, I always had bullies growing up, you know? <laughs> yeah, but you got that fucking, that cement fucking jaw. So that was working. <laughs> that worked well for you in your life, man. Right? <laughs> 
Okay. I mean, um, so yeah, wrapping it up, Brown Block Podcast, uh, where we talk to people, not about them. Okay. Thanks, Cabby, bro. No problem. Anytime. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs>